Well, good morning. It is good to see everybody here today. This morning, we're going to talk about the remedy for sin. And this is going to be part, of course, of six different lessons. This morning, earlier in our class, we spoke on the plan of salvation. Well, we're going to see that as part of that plan of salvation, there must be a remedy for sin because there's no other way that we could stand pure and holy before our God. Now, as we tackle this topic, I want to first turn to Joshua. Joshua chapter 24, and here we will read verses 19 through 22. So Joshua 24, if you would. Joshua 24, now beginning, verse 19. Then Joshua said to the people, You will not be able to serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then He will turn and do you harm and consume you after He has done good to you. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen for yourselves the Lord to serve Him. And they said, We are witnesses. Joshua put before them choices. Every single day, every one of us has choices to make. Now as I thought about choices, I thought about a lesson that I did a number of years ago on Mother's Day. And in preparation for that lesson, I sent out an email that went to, oh, thousands of moms. And they sent me emails back. And I asked them, number one, what they wanted for Mother's Day. And for Mother's Day, they wanted time. And they wanted, uh, they wanted the children's love. And they wanted a little R-E-S-P-E-C-T. They wanted respect. But I also asked, well, what do you want, uh, not only from them, but what do you want for your children? He said, well, for our children, we want choices. And we just don't want any choices, although we do want choices for them and a great multitude of choices. But we want them to make godly choices. We want them to make good choices. Choices that are going to lead to them being healthy. Now, why did she want them to make godly choices? Well, we already read this morning in Romans 3 and 23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, that establishes that the wages of sin is death. Now, no mom, no dad, no one wants death for their children. Now, you'll notice with your handouts as we go along today and we, we uh, tackle the different items, I've tried to put all the scriptures within the lesson on your sheets because it's been said as I get going I'll go a little bit faster and you may miss some of these verses so hopefully that'll help you to keep along I try to state a lot of the things that we're going to have on those sheets so you'll be able to write them down for your further edification but when we think about these choices and we think about death to the children we think about death by sin to be healthy we must all seek a remedy when physical ailments come upon us, we go out and we search for a remedy. Second Kings chapter 5, there's a gentleman by the name of Naaman. Now Naaman, Naaman is the captain of the Syrian army. And he has leprosy. Leprosy is where your skin is rotting off. He didn't want to continue with that ailment. And so he sought a remedy and he heard that in the land of Judea, in the nation of Israel, there was a man that could help him, a prophet, a prophet by the name of Elisha. And so he goes and he is told by Elisha that he must dip into the river Jordan seven times and that his leprosy will be gone. And he follows that remedy, although at first somewhat reluctantly, he follows that remedy and he gets the cure. The leprosy goes away. He traveled to a far country to seek that remedy. When we go from sin to get out of the, the wages of death that's going to come with it, we have to travel to a far country. Now, of course, Naaman is not the only person who had physical ailments that sought a remedy. In the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 4, there in verse 
23 through 25, we're going to see our Lord and our Savior. And of course, He is healing. Matthew 4, now beginning there in verse 23. And Jesus was going about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease, and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about went him out into all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, taken with various diseases and pains, demonics, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. These were people who had ailments. They were from all different places, but they traveled to this far country so that they could get rid of of these physical ailments. Now when spiritual ailments fall upon us, we want to do the same thing. We want to seek for a remedy of the sin. Uh, and a, a remedy for that, of course, is forgiveness. Something we're going to talk in quite detail about this evening. Now forgiveness brings you back into the healthy state. It brings you back into that pure state, that clean state, that holy state, that unblemished state. Now, when we think about seeking a remedy for it, often we seek in two places. Number one, we seek for man, for a spiritual remedy for our sin. You can think back in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 17. It tells of the brothers of Joseph. Now, Joseph's brothers, when he was younger and he had 11 other brothers, these brothers sold him into slavery. He wasn't too happy about that, of course. I don't think anyone would be. But in all circumstances, we see him doing what was right and making the best of the circumstance. Now, if it was me, I'm not sure. I guess I, in part I would think, boy, after a great period of time, I'd still be pretty begrudging to have gone through and been a slave because of my brothers. But later in the life, there in Genesis 15 and 17, those brothers come to him and they desire his forgiveness. And he had forgiven them. He had extended that. He had a heart wanting to forgive them. And so, of course, we see that these men seeking forgiveness, seeking that state of remedy from men. But, of course, man's not the only place that you're going to seek the remedy, the spiritual remedy for sin. You're certainly going to go toward God. When we think about those seeking for God's forgiveness... We can go back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, uh, the one who had Israel in captivity in Egypt. He tells Moses, ask your God for forgiveness for me. Moses at time, he says, Lord, he wants the forgiveness. The nation of Israel, they pray for forgiveness. And men throughout our New Testaments, they wanted forgiveness because they wanted to be free from the wages of sin. Now, when we have physical ailments, we seek out, seek out a physical doctor. If I go to the doctor and say, Doctor, I've broken my foot. He's going to say, Okay, here's what you need to do. We're going to put your foot in a cast. You're going to stay off your foot. You're not going to go run. But then if you see me uh, downtown Granby and I'm running in my boot and in my cast, they say, What are you doing? You're not going to heal up. Why are you not following the remedy that was given you? Why are you not following the prescription? In the same manner, you can have strep throat. You can go to the doctor and say, Doctor, I've got this physical ailment. What do I do? He says, you know what? Okay, we're going to give you antibiotics and antibiotics. And I also want you to drink clear liquids. And I want you to do this for 10 days and you'll be better. Now, if I want the remedy and if I want the cure, I've got to follow the remedy. I've got to follow the prescription. These things make sense. They go hand in hand. Now, not only do we want... Uh, uh, do we see this, of course, in our, our daily lives? But this is something that Christ taught. If you look over at Matthew chapter 9, verses 11 through 13, Matthew 9, now beginning verse 11, and when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, that is Jesus' disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax gatherers and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are ill. So he's right there saying, you know what, guess what? You have a physical ailment, you want a doctor, a physician. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion, not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He said, I came 
And now he's going to put in a spiritual ailment to it. I came for the sinners. I'm coming for those who are spiritually sick. He's made a physical application. Now he makes this spiritual application. He says, guess what? I'm the spiritual doctor. I am the great physician who has come to take the sin from the world. Now to be healthy though, we've got to follow the remedy. We've got to do what we've been instructed to do. Jesus' remedy is always about sin. It's never about anything else when, when we're uh, coming to Him. The ailment of sin ultimately results in death if we don't heed the ailment. Now fortunately, Jesus has the words of life. In fact, in John 6, 63, it's the Spirit that quickeneth the flesh, that is the things of the world, they profit nothing. The words that I speak unto you are spirit and are life. These are the words of Jesus. Now, you go down to verse 68, Peter says the same thing. He says, where else are we going to go? Jesus has the words of life. He is what will help us from a situation of being lost in sin. Now, turn over to John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, we're going to find something very important about these words of life that Jesus has. John 12, we're going to read here in verses 48 through 50. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me commandment. What to say? And what to speak. And I know that His commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Jesus has the words here that are going to judge us in the end. That is so important to understand. But He has words of life. And understand, the words that He speaks are words with authority. They're words with authority. Why? Because He identifies they come from the Father. So what's this prescription that we're talking about? What is this prescription that Christ establishes for sin? He says blood is the remedy for sin. Let's begin back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 9. I want you to understand some fundamentals about blood. Genesis chapter 9. We begin now in verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth... And the fear of you and the terror of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is, its blood. From the patriarchal age here, we see that blood is identified with life. Now in Leviticus, we come into a different age. We come into the Mosaic Age. That is the time frame of Moses. There in Leviticus chapter 17, I want to read verses 10 through 12 in this text. Now beginning verse 10. And any man from the house of Israel or from the aliens, aliens being visitors from other places, people of other countries, who sojourn among them, who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Now atonement, so you understand, atonement means to cover over. So this transgression, uh, this transgressions must need to be atoned for. They must be covered over. Continuing on, verse 12. Therefore I said to the sons of Israel, No person among you may eat blood, nor may any alien who sojourns among you eat blood. Blood covers over the sins of man. More understandably, it enables what we want. Forgiveness. Hebrews 9. 22, according to the law, I may also almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In Acts chapter 15, we're going to look at verse 29. We have Paul going down to meet with a church in Jerusalem. He's going down because he'd been up in Antioch and there had been those who had been 
attempting to teach things of the old law, the Mosaic law, even though they were now under law in Christ. And he goes down to Jerusalem because he wants to see if these things are so. And when he comes down there and he talks to the apostles and the elders uh, down there, and they say, you know what? No, we, we don't teach those things. That's, there were some men that did that, but we, we don't hold by those. And of course, there's great relief in that. But they understand they've got a problem. Because there are folks going out and teaching us. So they say, you know what, we need to write something up and send back to those churches to affirm we're not holding to the teachings these other people are trying to say. And so what do they do? Well, there in verse 29 of Acts chapter 15, let's pick up verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay and understand everything they said, everything the apostles did was by inspiration, or everything they wrote and said was by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It says, good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. You abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free some, from such things, you will do well, farewell. They want to establish a couple of basic principles. One, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and very specific to us, say abstain from blood. So we have them doing that in the patriarchal age, we have them doing that in the mosaic age, and we have them doing that from here. Necessarily inferring here from the, the uh, implications that God has given to us, we can say, because blood was in the life, they continue to abs or life was in the blood, they continue to abstain. Now those three passages, in those three ages, reject the eating of blood because life in the sin. Or, I said that again, life in the blood. But let's look at John 6 and 53, because we have a bit of a quandary that we, though we will not dwell on it at the moment, we're going to come back to. But it is very important because it does involve the blood and it does involve life. John 6 and there in verse 53, Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood... You have no life in yourselves. Boy, that sounds like a contradiction. And some folks will say, the Bible contradicts itself. So hold on to thought, because we must come back to this. But note, even if it was a contradictory statement, what does it do? It ties life and blood together. And that is so very important. Now let's go back, and we want to look at the different ages. But this time when we look at blood, instead of understanding essentials about it, we want to understand how it is the remedy for sin. We go back to the patriarchal age, and the fact is we know pretty little about what God commanded those folks in that time frame. What do we have, though? We do see Cain and Abel coming forth and offering up to God, Cain not having an acceptable sacrifice, but Abel having one because of his faith. Well, if it was because of faith... We know it was by hearing, because Romans 10, 17, faith comes by, I did it again. I don't know why I'm doing that. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. For some reason that verse does not want to stay in the brain today. But we see that it was an acceptable sacrifice. It was something that he'd heard, something that God had commanded him. And the sacrifice that Abel gave was one that involved blood. Now we go to the next age. We go to this Mosaic age. In the Mosaic age we're going to see that blood was a remedy for sin under this Mosaic covenant. Exodus 24, 8, Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. The blood was sprinkled upon them as a cleansing effect. They were to be pure. But see, they're going to have other encounters with the blood. During the time frame of law, there were five specific types of offerings given. There were uh, meal offerings, there were peace offerings, there were burnt offerings, there were sin offerings, which is very important to us as we look at the remedy for sin, and there were trespass offerings. Now the burnt offerings, the meal offerings, the peace offerings, uh, these, uh, these items were voluntary. But the last two, the sin and the trespass offerings, they were most certainly mandatory. When we look at the sin offering, and we look at the things that were offered up, that they were sacrificed. We see that for the high priest or for the nation, a bull was sacrificed. The blood of the bull was needed, and it was an unblemished, an unspotted, a clean bull. Then for the ruler of the people, we saw that a goat, a male goat, 
was to be offered up. And then for the people, an unspotted, unblemished she-goat or lamb. For the common person, and I find that quite interesting when we talk about the Lamb of God, that is Jesus Christ. But we'll get into that. Now as mentioned previously, sacrifices were an atonement. Sacrifices, when we specifically talk about blood, they're going to forgive sin. Leviticus 4.20, Thus shall he do with the bullock, as he did with the bullock of the sin offering. So shall he do with this. And the priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. Now I know we talk about it, and we're going to look at a couple of things in regard to forgiveness and the old law. But right here in Leviticus it says, you will be forgiven. In fact, there are four instances in Leviticus 4 alone, not just considering all of the Old Testament, all of the Mosaic Law, where forgiveness was stated to, uh, uh, to occur. Now understand that these sins that were being atoned for, that were being covered over, were sins that were not deliberately and defiantly against God. Sins that were deliberately and defiantly against God, the people were taken outside of the camp. They were no longer part of the nation of Israel. Numbers 15, 30, and 31. Now the sin offering, when we think about the five different offerings, the meal, the peace, the burnt, the sin, and the trespass, the sin offering came before all the other offerings. Why was this? Well, we've already talked about before Isaiah 59, 1 through 2, your sins separate yourself from God. You had to have the sin offering first because it atoned for the sins. Therefore, you could stand pure before God at that point and present your other offerings. You could engage in worship because the sins were gone. Now let's look at blood. We've looked at blood in the patriarchal age. We looked at the mosaic age and we're going to come back because I know there are going to be some questions in regard to this. But blood is the remedy for sin now in the Christian age. Now do we offer up sacrifices, animal sacrifices? Not going to see it happening. There are no such offerings of that nature today. Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, the Son of God, came to this earth to atone for our sins. John the Immerser says of him in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How is it he takes away sin? Ephesians 1.7, We have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of our trespasses. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So we have redemption through His blood, through that sacrifice. We're in Him so we have the righteousness of God. That means we have the purity of that. We also see and we've read that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Christ shed His blood for us. The life was in the blood. It was in the blood of Christ. Now understand when these sacrifices that occurred under the Mosaic Law, the people would bring the sacrifices forward, they would hold the head of the sacrifice, and the animal was slain. Their blood, they understood their blood, the blood of the sacrifice was be given, it should have been their blood, it should have been their life. But they were transferring their sins to the sacrifice, and they were receiving the life from the sacrifice. The same way occurs with Christ. We have Christ as our sacrifice. He became our sin. He, the sins were transferred to Him. And through His blood, we have the life. Now to be... Well, no, let's stop for a moment. What's the difference between the remedy for sin in the old law and the new law? Under the old covenant and the new covenant. This has to be answered as we go back to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Specifically looking now at the difference between forgiveness and the old law and the new. There in verse 4, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Ha! I knew it, preacher. What are you saying? You get forgiveness under the old law. That's not possible. Does this verse say it's impossible to have them forgiven. No. This is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. We already read in Leviticus and other passages in the Old Testament, there is forgiveness under that Mosaic law, under the sacrificial system. But what happened? 
Each year, they had a day of atonement. They had to remember the sins. Those sins were not taken away. They had to be continually brought up and put before them. They had to continually remember that. But with Christ, with Christ we have a perfect sacrifice. Now let's look at... Verse 3, of course, mentions the atonement. Let's go down here and look at verses 14 through 18 of Hebrews 10. For by one offering, He, that is Christ, has perfected for all time those who are sanctified, set apart. You're set apart in Christ. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, This is that covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart. I will put upon their mind. I will write them. And then He says, And their sins and their lawless deeds... I will remember no more. Now this is Jeremiah speaking back in Jeremiah 31, 31, being quoted by the author of Hebrews here. And it, the information he was given was to be under the new covenant, that in Christ. He says, guess what? In that we don't continue to have this day of atonement and all that. Why? Because the sins are remembered no more. Now, hold on to that thought because tonight we're going to ask, do we remember our sins anymore? And the answer might be surprising. But we'll come to that point then and we'll move on for the moment. To be free from sin, how is the remedy administered? That is the blood. And how long does it have to be applied? If you take an antibiotic, it's not just one pill. You've got to continue taking the pill, right? For a period of time. How long do we have to administer the blood and how do we apply it? Number one, covenants are established by coming into contact with the blood. This was true for Noah. It was true for Abraham. It's true for the children of Israel. Throughout history, you see covenants established, and they're established with a contact with blood. Now, in understanding this, this fact, Christ's blood is identified as a covenant of forgiveness in his blood in Matthew 26 and 28. Knowing this, it's easy to find out how we come into contact with the remedy for sin. Where is the covenant entered into with Christ? Because that's where we're going to come in contact with that blood. It's going to be where the sins are forgiven. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter tells them, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If sins are being forgiven at that point, someone had to come in contact with the blood at that point. Acts 22.16, arise and... Let's look at it. Acts 22.16, don't want to misquote it. Acts 22, verse 16, And now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized. And wash away your sins, calling on His name. Now Peter said, repent and be baptized, and we have forgiveness of sins. We come to Acts 22.16, we see there's a washing away of the sins. A reference to baptism. So that's got to be where you come into contact with the blood to have those sins washed away. We see further confirmation of this in Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, we will look here at verses 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we've been buried with Him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him, that our body of sin might be done away with and that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for He who has died is free from sin. If we were crucified with Him in the act of baptism, guess what? We came into contact with His blood. If we came into contact with His blood, we have the forgiveness of sins. Consequently, we have the remedy of sin, which is the objective of the plan of salvation that we talked about this morning. We are baptized into His death. We come into contact with the blood. Revelation chapter 7. By the way, Granby has a fantastic analysis, both in part from Bobby and David, and a look at Revelation that I highly encourage you to look at online. But here in Revelation <clears throat> chapter 7, there, lost my spot, verse 14. This is a heavenly scene. 
And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We often talk about, and there are parables uh, specifically at the wedding feast, where folks come in and they don't have the proper wedding clothes. The proper wedding clothes are the proper deeds. When you wash your robes, you wash your deeds, you've put on deeds of purity, deeds of goodness in Christ. These folks had washed their robes. They'd done away with the sinful things. They stand before God in His presence because they're pure and they're holy. How did they wash them away? They did it through baptism, contact of the blood. They had the forgiveness. So it's administered, this remedy for sin, through baptism. But how long do they have to stay in contact with it? I mean, should we jump into the baptismal every day? Is this how we do every time we sin? How do we go about doing this? Well, 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9 Beginning verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him, that is God, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. From this verse we see we walk in the things of the Lord. We walk in the pure things. We walk, we abide in him as it were. We do these things. We're continually washed by that one time sacrifice and we stay pure and holy before our Lord and our Savior. We are, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 21, as Christians, in the righteousness of Christ. We're spotless, we're undefiled, we're unblemished, we're free from that plague of death, of sin, while we're in Christ. Part of abiding in Christ was seen in John 6.53, which we said we would go back to. So let's do that. John 6.53, we were talking about blood. And specifically in talking about blood, getting a little bit of echo there, David. Can you hear that or no? Specifically in talking about blood, and there in verse 53, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in yourselves. This verse says we were to drink the blood of Christ. But we've been talking about don't take in the blood. Is it an opposite command of abstaining from the blood? No, it's not. Matthew 26, 27 through 28, if you would. Matthew 26, we're going to read verses 27 through 28. In this text, Christ having the cup, He took a cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is My blood of the covenant, which is to be shed on behalf of many for forgiveness of sins. Was He giving them His blood? No, He was giving them the fruit of the vine. He was looking at it from a spiritual standpoint. We don't take the physical blood, but we take the spiritual blood of Christ. And that's what he's talking about when he says to drink of to it. It's a representative of the covenant of the blood of Christ. This morning when we partook of the Lord's Supper, we did what people who enter covenants of blood have done through ages. That is, we come back to our covenant renewal. We renew our covenant, that covenant of blood for the forgiveness of sins with Christ at the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. We come in contact with that blood saying, yes, we will continue to honor the details of your covenant. That is to be faithful and pure and holy to your commandments. Our fellowship breaks with Christ only when we become, when we become willingly defiant of Christ. When we reject what he wants. And what happens when you do that? That's when we're put outside of the camp. That's when we don't have the cleansing of the blood anymore. Question. Are we partaking of the remedy which has been prescribed? Are we partaking of the blood of Christ? Have we come in contact with it? And are we continuing to renew the covenant and abide in Christ as John 8, 31 through 32 would establish? There's a great day coming. A great and awesome day in the Lord. That is a day that if you've been in the blood and you're in the righteousness of Christ, and you're keeping the covenant, it's going to be a wondrous, amazing day. It's a day where you're going to be spotless, you're going to be eternally healthy. 
You'll be in fellowship with God. You'll be in fellowship with His saints. You'll be in fellowship with Jesus. But, you cannot choose, or I guess you can, you can choose to not partake of the remedy for sin. You can say, you know what, I'm not going to follow the things of God. I'm not going to be baptized. I'm not going to abide in this covenant. I'm not going to continue to renew the covenant. I'm not going to do what he says. That is your option. Remember, this whole thing where we start out is about choices. Mom, Dad want you to make godly choices. But you can say, I don't want to. Hebrews 10, 26-29. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, we've heard, there remaineth no more a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fierceness of fire which shall devour the adversaries. A man that has said it not that uh, Moses' law died with compassion, without compassion on the word of two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment think ye shall you be judged worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath despised under the Spirit of grace. In English, if you turn your back on God and you say, you know what, I don't care about that sacrifice that Jesus offered up for me, there will be great and terrible punishment, terrible judgment on that final day. But it's your choice. It's your choice. Mom wants us to make godly choices. Dad wants us to make godly choices. Our brothers and sisters in Christ... We want to make godly choices and we're to spur one another and encourage one another, which we'll talk about this week, to make godly choices. Take up your songbooks. David, what was our invitation number, sir? 276. 276. There's power in the blood. Blood is indeed the remedy for our sin. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There is power in the blood. If you have not chosen to take part in the remedy for sin, won't you please do that today? If you'd all stand, you may come forward while we sing the song of invitation.